Oh my word, we've actually heard from the Chelsea owner. Could you believe it? You ain't so tough with that bad boy tuck. I'ma get it how I'm living, I'ma walk the walk. Outline my lines, I rap through thought. Mm, what's happening people welcome back to the channel football therapy with me your host Yan. I hope you're doing well I genuinely do hope that there's so much to talk about today an athletic article from Crafton talking about uh, Todd Bowley's interview with uh, was it a someone we spoke about Chelsea uh, the recent form the, the plan Cole Palmer and stuff like that speaking of Cole Palmer nominated for young player of the year I'm gonna give my thoughts on that in just a second and the South American sports expert gassing us Chelsea fans up about both Messinio and Paez uh, which is excellent stuff and I can't wait to share it with you in this video friends so I'll thank you for joining me for the moment uh, thank you for continuing your support by simply liking and subscribing. If you choose to subscribe, hitting the bell. Still at the desk, still got an ear infection. It's going to be one of those things that's going to take me a while to shake, but I am on antibiotics now, so pray for me. Send me your sweet love and affection, and let's get into it. Starting off with Cole Palmer, of course, nominated, unsurprisingly, for Young Player of the Year by the Premier League, which I think is different to the PFA, isn't it? The Premier League. Um, so dumb how both Foden and... Harland are involved with Young Player of the Year. I thought it was like 21, 22 and under. But like, Phil Foden literally turns 24 in like, f like this month in a few days. I mean, go away, bruv. Do you know what I mean? Like, go and just... I, in my head, I was like, definitely not Phil Foden. Because Phil Foden's been excellent this season. But like, he should not qualify for Young Player of the Year. Young player, and plus, these days, young young players, inverted commas, are getting younger and younger and younger. Um, I genuinely thought it was like 21 and under, or maybe if you were 22 later on, um, you can somehow sneak in and qualify. But the fact how Foden's about to turn 24, because like, Phil Foden, sh sorry, Cole Palmer should walk this award. He should moonwalk this award. He should backflip into it. And um, the fact how somehow... Harland and uh, Foden can be in there. It's just so boring. It's so boring. So that rule can do one. Um, we are going to spend the majority of this video today going through this article. Just stretching out my body here. Um, my hot, hot bod. Um, but I do want to show you this. One, two, three, bang. Nathan Joyish, or Joyers, South American football writer and expert, says this. The world... The world? The word generational is thrown around way too often. However, I have to tip my hat towards Chelsea here. Both Kendry Paez and Istovao are the two... What, deep this, guys. The two of the best talents I've ever witnessed in South America. South America, bro! Not even, like, you know, their respective, like, like Brazil or whatever. South America. You will not find... A better duo across the entire continent right now. Wow. Now, for those of you who understandably find it hard to get excited about players that won't arrive till next summer, um, which is getting closer and closer, I get it, but I don't want to go all freaking Project 2030 on you guys, like, because football is about the now, you know. It's good to ensure the future, but football is ultimately about the now. It's about what's happening this weekend. That's what we care about. But there is an element of awesome, you know. If we we have actually locked down these two superstars, then, um, then there is positivity. You know, they're probably on 45-year contracts, so they're not going to be going anywhere. Um... And there is this element, maybe, of Chelsea just stockpiling talent. And granted, it's all right-sided talent, young right-sided attackers. But ultimately, like, it means you're going to, like... Even though they won't all be able to play and you'll sell some and make profit, whether it's Hutchison, Gab Angelo, Gabriel, um, well, you know, Cole Palmer's going to make it. But, you know, is Nonny going to make it long-term? Is he going to be that good to push out uh, Messino, um, you know, Kendry? This guy was, in his replies, this guy's tweeted... Who, reputable writer was saying like even selfishly he'd kick Cole Palmer out of the lineup just because as this guy's watched South American football it would be like this metaverse dream to watch um Estevao and Kendry play together in the same team uh you think that would be such a treat you think they'd have great chemistry and you know I'm sure we'll find a way at some point to get a lot of these players in um and you know people are arguing on social media well who's gonna play who's gonna play well 
whoever's the best, baby. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? All these superstar talents. Whoever, like, is genuinely a worldie, you can play for Chelsea, mate. It's a good problem to have, I must say. So, ultimately, this can only prove to be a good thing. If it, it at worst, it's a money-making exercise, which will be helpful to us. I know that's, like, unsavory or cynical, but, you know, it's where we're at. But at best, Chelsea of the future, superstar South American Galacticos. You'd love to see it. All right, let me just sip my hot beverage. Oh. And we're going to jump into this article from Adam Crafton. Um, I'm not going to do overlays. I'm just going to read it with you here and, and talk about it because this is interesting. And uh, I think there we just need to talk about it, you and I, you know. So Chelsea chairman Todd Bowley says the team's past two and a half games demonstrate the signs of the club's plan, quote, coming together as head coach Pochettino's future continues to attract scrutiny. So this is why I, I haven't read this, but I know some of the quotes. So I want to read it with you guys because many people think Pochettino is not in favor of the owner. So. It'll be interesting to learn this together. Chelsea remain in seventh place in the Premier League table amid another testing season, to say the least, after finishing the first full campaign under the stewardship of LA Dodgers owner Bowley and private equity firm Clear Lake Capital. Of course, we finished 12th last season. <clears throat> Excuse me. Still sick, of course, so there'll be a bit of clearing throat, etc. Pochettino's relationship with the club's ownership and sporting directors, Win Stanley and Stewart, has been under the microscope in recent months, with the Argentines suggesting contact with the owners has been limited. In response to questions regarding his relationship with Win Stanley and uh, Stewart, um, Pochettino said in the last month, he said this, quote, That's a good question for them if you have the opportunity to ask them. Mm. Uh, but it's not a subjective idea of us that we have problems. It's the reality. I think he's sort of saying he just apparently he's not spoken to them in a few months, which is pretty wild, really, because they were like on the blower to him all the time. Especially Tuchel and Potter, they were like, "What's happening? What's happening? Talk to us! Talk to us!" And then they just disappear. Do they not love him anymore? The coach's position will be reviewed at the end of the campaign, but you, but he may take some optimism from the public comments made by Bowley during a Sportico conference in Los Angeles on Wednesday. Pochettino's initial contract signed last summer was, of course, a two-year agreement with an extension for one more. So the extension's an option for Chelsea to trigger if they want. Um, so he's got 12 months left on his like contract that we're obligated to pay him for. Bowley, who was not asked about the head coach during his interview, I reckon that was like a, a pre-planned thing, like, don't ask me if we're going to sack the coach or about the coach. But he did say some interesting stuff. He said this, quote, We've seen in the last two and a half games, at least in the second half of Aston Villa and Tottenham, of course, the 2-0 win. Uh, well, the second half of Aston Villa was two goals, no reply. Tottenham was two goals, no reply. West Ham was five goals, no reply. Where we played just beautiful football, says uh, Todd Bowley. Did we play it? Yeah, we, West Ham, we played beautiful football. Absolutely. He says this. It was so fluid. It was exactly the way we drew it up when we came out of the back. Built up and moved in the pitch. It was good, very organized, and the number of shots we had on the on board. Hold on. Who drew this up, Todd, mate? Did you draw up this tactical plan? I thought you ever friggin' spoken to the manager for, like, months in those two and a half games, you could really start to see what we were working on and coming together. Working on coming to... You can see what we're working on and coming together. Okay, I guess he's saying, like, we as a club, which I guess... I mean, it's his club, but, like, it's a little bit like, we? <laughs> what, what have you been doing, mate? <laughs> uh, I mean, he's... Okay, he's the chairman, whatever. I do, I, I'm trying to be fair here. Like, he's the chairman of Chelsea and he's the owner. He can say, we and this is our plan, I guess. But there is an element of... You know, what are you doing, you know? Anyway, I suppose he hired the guys or whatever. Let's be fair. Even the commentary has changed over the last two and a half games. I've never seen anything change quite quickly. Welcome to European football, mate. The narrative will flip-flop quicker than anything you've ever seen in your life. Something I try and personally not do. I try and hold firm and, and, and maintain my often, hopefully, measured philosophy. And many of you enjoy that, I'd like to think. But um, there's a lot of flip-flopping in football. I see it like the mental gymnastics, the people changing their... People that go in so viscerally with their emotive opinion. And I understand I'm not criticising them because it's what the game does to you. 
and then just change. That's why I don't use Twitter anymore, because you just see every week people changing their opinion. Bowley was speaking during a one-to-one session in West Hollywood. He was asked why he decided to invest in Premier League football, having previously acquired, of course, the LA Dodgers baseball team. He says this. There's no bigger sport in the world. When you think about the size and scale of European football, it's just mind-numbing, and there's no better league in the world than the Premier League. If you look at how these guys play, the speed of which they play the game, very true, it's very fast. So th- Yeah, so this is a quote I saw, and I found this very interesting. One of my players who I had a great relationship with is Kalido Koulibaly. That was crazy, because you had him for 12 months, and you shipped him off to Saudi. Koulibaly came over from City A, where he played for Napoli, and he told me in this one time, quote, In City A, I get to think and then run a bit. But in the Premier League, I have to run while I think. <laughs> and I'm still adjusting to that. It's weird how he like a great relationship with Koulibaly and just uh, flogged him immediately. <clears throat> I ain't got nothing against that. Like, he clearly was a shadow of his former self, Koulibaly. Bowley also said that he was supportive of, this is interesting, of the new proposals within the Premier League to add a hard spending cap to the new squad cost rules that are being introduced for the uh, 25-26 season. So the season after next. That's the season where we'll have Esteval and uh, Paez. Also, maybe they are being smart because we'll have players on low wages. Maybe they've seen this coming and they are actually doing intelligent planning. Maybe. Based on the concept of anchoring, the de facto salary cap would limit the amount of money any club can invest in their squads by trying it to a multiple of what the lowest earners from the league gets. Yeah, so centralised broadcast and commercial deals. Yeah, so this is interesting. So, like, say, friggin' Sheffield United this season, or Luton. Maybe Luton, because... Or whatever, whoever owns the most... uh, It says commercially, so I guess it won't be, like, stadium costs. You can only invest in your squad x amount more than um than what that play so you can't just absolutely you know psg would be screwed basically like they couldn't just pull this money in because even if they're allowed like 10 here's a freaking emotes again might as well do this where's the balloons mate go on bring the balloons back no now now i just look an absolute mug uh, there we go i mean this do i look less of a mug now that's the question for you Oh, yeah, so if PSG were allowed like 10 times or 15 times the revenue earning of the 20th place in Ligue 1, the French League, they'll still be screwed. Like, they wouldn't be able to compete in the Champions League. Well, like, they'd have to be run like more of a proper club, like a sensible football club, which they're trying to do, I suppose, to their credit. Um, and yeah, I mean, that would, that would mean you need to be leaning into... To, to get your marginal gains, you'd be need to leaning into sensible scouting going to south america but i mean maybe maybe this is smart from the owners because they've said from the beginning i think they foresaw all this like there's loads of value in young players that are untapped instead of playing 100 million pounds for a striker you pay a lot for a young guy 40 million you know that no one would usually pay but you're like yeah this kid's gonna be the 100 million striker in a few years and uh, we're buying him now so we're gonna uh, you know fall into line with all these new rules and of course i know we're selling all our academy stars but we've still got an amazing academy and that would get with this new salary cap that would give us the edge utilizing an excellent academy so again it's all like speculative and it should be good and might work but it's better than just no planning whatsoever do you know what i mean so this will be formally voted on in a meeting in the premier league's annual general meeting in june this this new rule with the salary cap chelsea abstained from the initial proposals uh meeting last week but Bowley indicated his support on stage on wednesday he says this we're supportive of anything that adds a competitive nature to the to the sport the reason the premier league is doing so well is because it's competitive and everyone wants to watch it and no one knows how the games are going to happen of course unless you're watching a man city game if you look around at what's going on right now in different European leagues, some of them are having a hard time selling their media rights. Liga. Uh, I think it's competition, competitiveness that you're going to continue to see and evolve as the sport evolves. <laughs> I'm trying to make it a little bit more like American sports, I guess. You know, obviously with like the draft and stuff like that, making it more equal. I mean, classic football fans won't want to hear any relation like to become american sports a lot of fans will be repelled by that but all they'll be doing is stopping certain sides from juicing up financially too much which i think everyone 
ultimately would agree with. Bowley was uh, also asked about the Premier League, how it can continue to boost its popularity in the United States, where the television deal with NBC was worth $2.7 billion uh, for the last six seasons leading up to 2028, and where the Premier League television audiences have been recorded on six occasions in the uh, past 16 months. He says this, you have to make it relevant to them, young people. And I think about the sport becoming more and more relevant in America, that is. The window is that they have on the East Coast is particularly su- Saturday morning and Sunday morning where there's nothing really competes with other sports. Yeah, he said this before because obviously sports generally aren't in the mornings. So it, there's just this like slot in America where you've just got sports on that nothing else is on. And if you want to watch sports in the morning, like why not, you know? Um, it would be interesting. Like some people around here that get, you know, in the UK that get up really early. Uh, some people do just get up at six or seven every day. And if there's like Man, uh, the equivalent of like Man City Liverpool on at that time in the morning from you know another country, you'd watch it, you know, because why the ruddy heck not? Um. So yeah, the fan fests uh, that the Premier League do from city to city, you can see them, it builds momentum. Hopefully Cole Palmer will become a household name here too. He's been a phenomenon for us and we're thinking hard about how we could expand out our brand to the United States. That's ultimately our priority as well. I mean, this was always going to be because we were probably going to be bought by American owners, but regardless of Chelsea being owned by American ownership, expansion into the US is just a smart... um, move at the moment for, for revenue one of the things that the premier league clubs have shown worldwide marks that they can use um we've got a global group of players from argentina to brazil yeah this is like been a benefit of chelsea for 20 years we've been a very global and multinational um team so we, you know chelsea have got massive african following we had some great african players and um yeah, it's, it's, you know, even like Pulisic, having Pulisic for a while. I know he wasn't amazing for us, but loads of Americans started supporting Chelsea. Part of the long range plan will be to really extend the brand as much as possible to build a fan base because ultimately the larger the fan base grows, the more competitive we'll be able to be because the salary caps are based on revenue. There's your, there's your plan. In order to compete, uh, you have to have growing revenue. And I think a brand like Chelsea really allows for that. Growing that brand, especially globally, is predicted, is sorry, is predicated. Here it is. Here's the juicy line that he said before and he's saying it again. And it's the one that we care about. Especially globally is, pre- globally is predicated on winning. I think that winning is the top of the things that's most important. When you're attracting a new fan, the key is to have something that's really aspirational. Yeah, so football culture in the UK for teams that aren't winning, it's either your local team, so you just go and watch a game, or you're sort of born into it, like Crystal Palace, you know. Unless you want to be like, oh, I don't want to be a sort of glory hunter, which loads of people are. I'm going to just choose a team in London. I'm going to support Crystal Palace. And to be honest, right now, it's probably quite an exciting time to support Crystal Palace as a new football fan, as an example. But generally, you inherit your sort of like allegiances. Or maybe you play FIFA and you're a glory hunter and you just want to watch the Galacticos or PSG or, you know, stuff like that. But um, winning is predicated on winning. That's the line. That's your headline right there. So it's, I mean, look, it's a shame they don't speak to the fan. I mean, this is all fine and well. Ultimately, it would be great to hear um, the sporting directors talk to the fans, like address the fans directly, rather than us hearing this third-party conference stuff. But it's... Um, I still find it interesting as a, as a Chelsea fan, as a football fan, really. So let me know what you guys think. Comment down below. Um, I can't wait to read your thoughts, as usual. I thank you for the support, as usual. And um, I hope to see you back here, again, as usual. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>